to this uh, public lecture hosted by the CU Department of Economics and Business. My name is Robert Lilly. I'm the uh, head of department. And uh, let me say a few words uh, by way of introduction. So I, I, I don't want to introduce Claudia Golden. That's uh, Andrea's job. But I, I do want to introduce Andrea. So uh, I think there are few people who are more qualified to speak about Claudia Golden's work than Andrea Weber. So Claudia Golden is a prominent female labor economist. Uh, Andrea Weber is also a very prominent female labor economist, certainly a leader in Europe and uh, beyond. And uh, she's the author of a uh, <clears throat> large number of very high profile articles uh, published in the best places. Her research touches on the uh, evaluation of active labor market policies, the role of women in leadership positions, uh, the choice between uh, career concerns and, and uh, fertility decisions, uh, whether or not firms that discriminate against women will go bankrupt or not. So uh, all these questions are, are, are directly relevant for, for today's talk as well. So she has, uh, I checked this morning, she has 9,733 Google Scholars citations, but I'm sure if she, you check now, she's going to have 10 more. Uh, She's a frequent author of David Hartz, another famous labor economist that uh, you might have heard of. Uh, so I don't know. So maybe 10 years from now will be some other prominent female labor economist will be standing here and talking about Andrea Weber's contribution to, uh, I don't know, some Nobel Prize winning work maybe, but I don't want to jinx anything. <laughs> So uh, so let me also tell you how this evening will play out. So my understanding is that Andrea plans to talk for 45, 50 minutes. And uh, so there's going to be plenty of time left for questions and answers. Uh, so feel free to take mental notes and then ask questions afterwards. And if you want to um, stay for a short reception, there's uh, wine and cheese available behind this door, uh, but this door will uh, open only after the time <laughs> the talk is over. So Andrea, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Robert, for the nice introduction. Can you hear me, Ben? This works? Okay, great. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming. It's, uh, it's very exciting to talk about uh, Claudia Gordon's work here today. And uh, so I hope you like it. Um, so Claudia Gordon uh, won uh, the uh, Swedish Reichsbank Prize uh, in economics in memoriam of Alfred Nobel uh, this year. And she was awarded uh, the prize for having advanced our understanding of women in the uh, labor market. And uh, so who is Claudia Goldin? Uh, let's uh, talk about uh, her career in, in a very, very, very brief way. So she was born in 1946 in New York City and uh, her education, she got in Cornell University and then a PhD at the University of Chicago and she graduated in 1972. Uh, so after uh, a career to many prominent uh, U.S. universities, she, she joined the faculty of Harvard University in 1990, and she is currently there, the Henry Lee Professor of Economics. Her fields of research are labor economics, uh, but also economic history. So she combines uh, historical um, knowledge uh, with, with labor economics, and you will see today uh, that this can be a very, very uh, uh, constructive way of approaching uh, certain topics. So, uh, so um, what do we know of uh, women in the labor market, which is the topic of uh, today? And so we know that uh, uh, worldwide uh, women are still underrepresented uh, in the labor market. 
So if you think of uh, women working or looking for work, uh, this is world by 50% of all women compared to 80% of all men. And over the last century, we have seen uh, that the share of women uh, in, in the labor market has been increasing tremendously in many high income countries. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, there are still uh, remarkable differences between men and women in labor market outcomes, such as earnings, for instance. Yeah? And these are the, the topics uh, we are going to talk about today. Claudia Golden uh, uh, did her research mostly on the United States. So we will talk about the United States labor market uh, mostly, uh, but we will also uh, talk about how uh, what the implications of this uh, research is uh, for worldwide or uh, also European labor markets. Okay, so uh, before I start, I, I would like to start with uh, two definitions uh, that you can uh, follow much more easily with uh, what I'm talking to, about if you're not uh, economists or not labor economists. Uh, so the first uh, definition that is a common definition in uh, labor economics is the labor force. Yeah? So what is the labor force? Uh, this includes all individuals who are, uh, who are employed or working for pay. Or, or those who are actively searching for work. Yeah, so every employee is in the labor force, every unemployed worker is in the labor force, uh, but uh, people who are in education are not in the labor force, uh, people who are retired are not in the labor force, or people who are uh, currently homemakers and are looking after children are also not uh, in the labor force. And then an important uh, economic indicator in this context is the labor force participation rate. So this is the fraction of the overall population uh, who is in the labor force. We can uh, split this by groups. For instance, we can compute the labor force participation rate for men and women, which we will do a lot, or we can also uh, do this by age groups and uh, lots of other groups. Yeah? But this is an indicator uh, which is going to come up a lot uh, during this talk, so I wanted to introduce first. Okay, so here we have uh, the uh, labor force participation rates of men and women in the United States. Uh, so this is a very, very prominent and uh, um, famous figure. And uh, so it spans here, it spans uh, the whole uh, 20th century. Uh, uh, here we go from 1890 uh, to 2000. And uh, so we have the labor force participation rate for men at the top. Uh, so we can see that this is a pretty flat line. Uh, it is almost 100%. So it means almost all men in all years uh, during this century have been uh, uh, participating in the labor force. So they were either working uh, or unemployed. And uh, compared to that, uh, the other uh, line here is showing the labor force participation rate of women. And we see that over this century, there were quite dramatic changes. So in the beginning of the 20th century, the labor force participation rate of women uh, was around 20%. And then it stayed low for quite a while, but after the 1940s, 50s, it started uh, increasing uh, tremendously. And uh, so by now, uh, this is 2000, but it is uh, not so much changed uh, in the last 20 years. Uh, by now, there is still a small gap, uh, but it is, uh, it's, it's a relatively uh, small gap uh, in the labor force participation rates uh, between men and women uh, um, compared to what it was 100 years ago. And you can draw very similar uh, graphs for many, many high income countries. Uh, so, this is uh, the US is by no way an exception. So, this increase in the labor force participation rate in some countries it happened sooner, in some countries it happened la later. Uh, but uh, so, these gaps, uh, uh, they are uh, current gaps, uh, they are relatively low. Yeah? And uh, so, in contrast to this, uh, here we have uh, the earnings uh, ratio. So, we have the earnings of women relative to the earnings uh, of men in each of these periods. Yeah? And these are earnings of women who are employed or who have earnings, and uh, earnings of men who have earnings. Uh, so, it's not any zeros included. And this uh, is a, a shorter um, time period. So, because of in the United States, comprehensive earnings measures were only uh, collected in the 1960s. As we can see this from 1960 to, uh, to 2020 almost. And uh, so the blue line gives us uh, this uh, earnings ratio for um, all workers. And uh, so this, this measure, uh, so because it's the ratio of female to male uh, earnings, we would have equality if this is equal to one. Yeah? So it, one is not even on this graph. So you can see that there was never any equality in earnings between men and women over this period. Uh, it started out relatively low, so that uh, women earned 60% of a men's earnings. So this uh, uh, was in the beginning of the period. And then uh, this didn't change much until to the 1980s, say. 
And after the 1980s, this gap started uh, to close. Yeah. It started to close until around uh, 2000 uh, for all workers. Thereafter, it, uh, this, this, uh, this uh, convergence uh, slowed down tremendously uh, and almost came to a standstill. The second line in this uh, graph gives us the, um, the female male earnings ratio for college educated women, so highly educated women. And here we can see initially the pattern was very similar to the old workers. Uh, but uh, for Polish educated workers, uh, this uh, uh, this convergence stalled much earlier and also at a lower rate. Yeah? So this is about seventy uh, percent. What uh, uh, highly educated women earn relative to highly educated men. Yeah? So we have these gaps in earnings between men and women still, and it doesn't seem that there is uh, much happening uh, in terms of closing. And these gaps are higher uh, the higher educated or the higher we get in the in the earnings distribution. Okay, and these are these uh, these are some of these puzzles uh, Claudia Goldin's research I wanted uh, to uh, to explain. Yeah. So she started uh, looking at um, the gender differences uh, in labor market outcomes um, in the 1980s. Uh, so this was a period where there were not lots of people looking at uh, gender differences. So uh, labor economists they always liked uh, to study women because uh, women uh, there was action. Yeah. So we saw in this picture here. Oops, sorry, the wrong way. Uh, so in, in this picture here, that over time, uh, this labor force participation rate for women was changing a lot. For men, nothing happened. Yeah? So if they wanted to study what happens if we increase taxes, uh, if they wanted to see some responses, they could only see the responses among women. Yeah? If they wanted to see what, what happens if we introduce a welfare policy, and they also could only see these uh, responses among women. So they were interested in studying women, uh, but nobody was really interested in studying why are women different from men. Yeah, what is the reason that they are so different, that they behave so differently uh, from men? And this is where Claudia Boarding comes in. Yeah? So she started uh, to document and explore these gender differences in much more detail. Uh, so to see why, uh, what is different between men and women, and uh, then did this change uh, uh, over time? And then, uh, so with this, uh, with this uh, exploration, she also found uh, um, explanations for this uh, for this uh, uh, for these changes over time. Yeah? She uh, she found reason why uh, we can see this increase in female labor force participation. Why we can see a uh, narrowing in the gender earnings gap in some periods and not in others. Uh, so. Uh, and she did this uh, in an historical context. So there is a very her uh, historical knowledge and the experience uh, comes into the play. Yeah? So she so looked over this uh, very long uh, time periods. This we will see she looked over uh, more than two hundred years uh, of of data uh, to find out what was going on, and uh, she found uh, very very reasonable and novel explanations for uh, for the historical developments. Uh, but she didn't only stop with the history, uh, so, so she also uncovers driving forces of today's uh, gender differences. Yeah? So today we uh, see, still see lots of differences, and we also have much more detailed data, and we can uh, look into uh, much more uh, finer um, population groups. Uh, so she looks also uh, into these things. Okay, so what do, do we need uh, to uh, understand these gender differences? Uh, so first, uh, we, uh, Claudia Gordon uh, uses this historical uh, perspective to study long-term evolution of labor market differences in a single country. So she really focuses on the US, and we can do this uh, for many other countries. We can also do it uh, across countries, uh, but this uh, way uh, it works very well. And uh, for this uh, longitudinal analysis, we, of course, need data. We need very, very uh, long-term data. So you need historical records of employment and earnings, and then, uh, if possible, even more information. And then uh, we need a framework that interacts this uh, labor market outcomes, so this employment, uh, labor force participation, and earnings outcomes uh, with lot of, lots of other factors that also may play a role uh, in explaining these determinants. Uh, so we, uh, we need to see how this interacts with education decision, with fertility decisions, uh, with productivity, with uh, institutional changes, technological changes, um, and uh, interactions also across cohorts. So how um, daughters um, um, look at their mothers as an example, or their grandmothers even, and uh, how this impact, uh, impacts uh, outcomes. 
Okay. So uh, in the media, Claudia Golden uh, is often uh, depicted as doing uh, economic detective work. And so this is a, a graph uh, which was uh, produced by this uh, Nobel Prize Committee. Uh, so she really went uh, into the archives and uh, looked for data. Yeah? So to, to get this uh, historical perspective or to get lots of details that were not, were not readily available. Uh, so she spent a lot of time uh, in archives uh, digging out very, very specific information and trying uh, to compile uh, in the end of the day all these uh, different sources of, uh, of information. Yeah. So this was a, a, a lot of work. She did it on her own, and I think she, she didn't have lots of people who uh, supported her doing this, uh, but uh, this was her as, uh, one of her special contributions uh, to economic research. Okay, so how did she uh, go about uh, uh, digging out these historical measures of employment and earnings. Uh, so first she documented uh, that there was an uh, undercounting of uh, female workers uh, due to changing a uh, definition of the labor force participation. Yeah? So the labor force uh, in the 19th century was a very different concept uh, than it is today where uh, people uh, are in employment and have work contracts. Uh, in, in previous time they worked at home and uh, produced uh, goods at home. So the labor force uh, definition changed, and this was uh, had a special impact, especially for uh, for for the definition of uh, women's work. Yeah, so men again, they didn't change so much, but women uh, much more substantially. In the older sources, for instance, um, the labor market status of women was only um, reported as being a wife. Yeah? So this was all uh, all the information there was. If you think of a wife today, we would think that this is somebody who is out of the labor force, who is not working, who is a homemaker. Uh, but in the historical context, wives uh, were, were not really out of the labor force because they were working in the farm or they were working in the family business. Uh, so this is, uh, was very, very little uh, information and she tried to infer from these wife uh, reports about these women were really doing and uh, how much they were producing and how much they were working. So she made uh, she made corrections to this uh, official statistics, which uh, indicated that the labor force participation rates of uh, women were much uh, higher uh, than it would, uh, would uh, take them at, at face value. Uh, then uh, prior to 1890, um, there were also censuses. So in the United States, uh, they uh, conducted censuses every uh, 10 years where they um, monitored the whole population. Uh, but prior to 1890, women uh, did not, uh, uh, were not included in the census. Uh, so this was only men. So there, uh, the, the information became even more scarce. So it, it was not only just the wife, but there was no one. Uh, so uh, Gordian went out to, uh, uh, to these archives and uh, collect um, data herself. Uh, so there were business records of, uh, for, for, for little firms. Uh, there were budget surveys, there were income reports, and uh, so she tried to combine the information from all this archival uh, data uh, to come up with uh, some measures uh, of labor force participation, say, or income of, of women. An example of, uh, uh, of this uh, record she, was, uh, she found is a sample of uh, households in Philadelphia which were headed by women. Uh, so this is a large sample of 12,000 households uh, spending the whole 19th century from 1791 to 1860. And uh, so these were female headed households. So this means these women were either widows uh, because their husbands had already died or they were uh, young, un unmarried women. Yeah? And uh, so she piecing together from what these, what these, for instance, widows did and their businesses uh, they were leading. Uh, so she inferred that even before the husband died, uh, these women must have been involved in the business, otherwise they couldn't have taken it over. Okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, the kind of uh, results she got with all this very, very tedious uh, data work. Yeah, so here we put together a timeline uh, from that spans uh, uh, 200 years or more than 200 years uh, for the 19th and 20th century, and uh, which uh, plots the labor force participation from different, uh, from different sources. So this blue line here is the line more or less uh, we have seen before. Yeah? So what happened in the uh, 20th century, which is a large increase in female labor force participation. Uh, so here she splits it also by single women and uh, married women, and we can see that the development in these two groups are fundamentally different. 
And then, uh, so the new, uh, uh, the new information comes, uh, comes in uh, on the left-hand side of this graph, uh, where we can see the labor force participation as she put together from all these uh, archival records. And uh, so what we see here, it is, 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 is noisy and everything, uh, but it looked that, that these married and older women, uh, their labor force participation rates, they were uh, uh, declining over time. Yeah? So they were not going up, uh, but they were, uh, were going down. So previously, when, they, uh, when people had only looked at the 20th century and seen this increase, uh, they were thinking, or they, they were inferring from this, uh, that if the economy evolves, uh, if uh, the economy gets richer, more and more and more women enter the labor force. Yeah? So with economic development, uh, women participation becomes higher. Uh, this is not any more true if we look at the left-hand side here. Yeah? So it seems to be that uh, there is a U-shaped relationship between economic development and uh, female labor force participation rather than a, uh, than a linear increasing relationship. Yeah? So this was uh, completely new information. Nobody had known this uh, before. They could have maybe uh, hypothesized. Uh, but uh, but this was a uh, very very new information, and it's so by the um, by the quality of the data she put together. This was also uh, very reliable, uh, that it might have looked like this. So this is the one uh, part we have over these two hundred years, and the other part is the uh, the earnings ratio. Is again the ratio of a female relative uh, to male earnings, and also we have this uh, this long long uh, time period over two hundred years. So what we've seen before. In the graph before is this what happened after 1960s, this uh, gray dash line here, where we see this uh, uh, convergence uh, of um, female and male work uh, earnings. So these are lots of uh, different sources uh, from, uh, from manufacturing uh, industry. Um, and but uh, so we can also see of this as a kind of an average over those. And then there is also records for this, uh, this comes probably from this uh, Philadelphia uh, sample uh, for what happened in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the early 19th century. Yeah. And we can see that there, there, there is this uh, period of uh, convergence of uh, female and male um, earnings in the, uh, in the late uh, 19th, uh, 20th century, uh, but there were also other periods of convergence. So there was this early period of, con uh, of convergence uh, in, the, um, in the early 19th century. And then there was also some period of convergence in the, uh, in the early 20th century. And this was, of course, way before uh, this um, movement for equal pay, to, uh, equal pay for equal work, or gender equality laws were introduced. Uh, but there were already uh, these convergences going on, and it would be interesting to know uh, what was happening there and where, why, uh, where the women and male uh, um, earnings converging. Okay. So if you, uh, if you summarize this, uh, the, the result she gets from this historical data. Uh, data in the, uh, in the labor force participation or labor supply context. Uh, so we see this U-shaped relationship between uh, female labor force participation and economic development, and not uh, just the positive function. And the second uh, thing she, uh, she was showing uh, that this uh, participation increases also across cohorts. And what do I mean by this? If, uh, we have this graph. So here, uh, we plot on the horizontal axis the age, and so this is the age of these women. And then uh, these different lines are um, the labor force participation rates for women uh, as uh, they grow older uh, for different cohorts. So these were all the women born 1866 to 1975, and then uh, uh, younger and younger cohorts. Yeah? And uh, so what we can see when they are 20, we see an increase in labor force participation rate across cohorts. Yeah? Uh, but uh, over the life cycle, the patterns uh, are very, very different. Uh, so if you look at age 50, uh, so these cohorts uh, born in 1886, uh, they had very, very low labor force participation and was not very different from when they were younger. Uh, but then uh, increasingly, uh, the next 10-year uh, cohorts had much higher labor force participation. So it goes from 10% for this early cohort to 20% uh, percent for the next uh, cohort uh, to 40% uh, for the next cohort. Uh, so this, it seems to be the case uh, that something happened at different stages in their life and uh, which have uh, accelerated a lot uh, the labor force participation. And if you look at, so it was not the case uh, that uh, something happened that all women started working suddenly, uh, but in the specific groups of women. Here we have these 50 year old women. These are probably women uh, whose children have already uh, grown up and uh, come back uh, to the labor market after a child break. 
So this is this is also uh, important to take into account to interpret uh, what was happening over time because it was not happening all at once. Yeah? So there was not you know uh, dramatic increases suddenly in these labor force participation rates, but it seemed to be slow moving. Yeah? And this slow moving we can explain by this uh, by these forward effects at least part. Of okay. Oh, sorry. So in terms of uh, the uh, female uh, relative earnings, uh, so we see uh, that these earnings gap uh, seems to have um, uh, narrowed with uh, work opportunities for uh, for women, and this was way before uh, any movement for, to this equal pay for equal uh, work. And then uh, we also see uh, that uh, in the 20th centuries, even though uh, we have this uh, dramatic increase in female labor force participation, this was not uh, in parallel a movement uh, towards more equality in earnings uh, between men and women. And uh, so one uh, evidence for this is that uh, today we all still see substantial earnings gap between men and women in the same occupation. Yeah? So we can also slice uh, the labor market much, much more narrowly and look into uh, specific uh, occupations and measure within occupation the earnings gap between men and women because we think that they might be very, very similar if they work in the same, uh, in the same occupation. And uh, so this is the graph we have here. This is uh, for... Uh, 2009 to 2011, different occupations. So this each uh, each plot here is an occupation, and it measures the uh, the female to male um, earnings ratio. And then it is also uh, here it is um, ordered by the uh, male uh, by the male wage. So this is high income uh, occupations, and this is the is the low income occupations. Uh, but we can see that throughout these occupations, there is lots of uh, gaps. For the highest income occupations, the, the gaps tend to be larger, but then for the small uh, income occupations, uh, but uh, so there is a lot of uh, unexplained um, uh, differences between men and women in terms of earnings uh, still around. Okay. So the uh, Swedish Academy of Sciences, uh, they also put together this, this very, very nice uh, graph here, which shows this uh, U-shaped uh, relationship between economic development and the female labor force participation. And Claudia Golden, uh, so what she did in her research, she, she split up uh, this, uh, this, uh, this graph into different periods and uh, was looking at what, hap was, what, what was happening. So what were the economic changes and the underlying changes uh, to, explain, uh, to, to explain this whole pattern uh, over time. So she, st uh, so she starts first with this um, early period here. But the, uh, but the economy was mostly uh, an agricultural uh, economy. Uh, then it changed uh, to becoming uh, an industrial uh, economy. And uh, so she tried to um, understand what this change in the economy uh, meant for women and the labor force participation. And then uh, we, uh, we move on to the 20th century, where we see this uh, uh, relatively drawn out period of uh, low female labor force participation, and then the uh, slow increase at first, and then this fast increase we see in the, in the second part of the 20th century. Okay, so let's uh, uh, go along this, uh, 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 this schedule and uh, uh, try to see what happened over time and how this explains uh, female labor force participation and also the earnings differences. So we can start with the uh, uh, Industrial Revolution in the United States. Yeah, uh, so this, uh, this happened in the, uh, in the early 19th century and it is marked by the transition of the economy from an agriculture, agriculture to uh, manufacturing. Yeah, so uh, manufacturing factories were replacing agriculture in the production sector. And uh, they, of course, uh, offered lots of employment opportunities for men, uh, but also uh, for women. And in terms of women, this were uh, a special group, these were young, unmarried women who worked in these factories. Yeah? They worked in very different uh, industry sectors than the men. Women worked in uh, textiles, and men worked in uh, metal industry or whatever other in industries. Uh, and they had lots of uh, employment opportunities, uh, but uh, as soon as they got married, uh, they stopped working. Yeah? So they dropped out of their labor force and uh, went, went back to, have, to the household. And for these women who were married and who had children, for them it became much more complicated to combine work and uh, family life uh, once this, uh, the work was uh, located in factories. Yeah? So they couldn't work at home anymore, uh, but they would have had to work in the factories, uh, which was not 
possible. Uh, so the overall labor force participation rate was, uh, was declining because it was only the young women who had jobs, uh, but these uh, married older women, uh, so they were staying at home. Uh, so they have this, this decline in the labor force participation rate uh, during this period. And then uh, so as, as this industrialization uh, moved on, uh, there was also more need uh, for, uh, for office work. And this office work, uh, of course, uh, um, and gave another employment opportunity for women. So there was also, uh, in parallel, there was the um, movement towards high school education. So the uh, public education in the United States was uh, greatly expanded. So that these women also were better educated than these agricultural and uh, factory workers. And uh, so they, uh, they moved to these uh, office jobs, but still, uh, women left uh, their jobs up, uh, until marriage. So it was still the young and single uh, workers who were, uh, were also working in these early office jobs. This, uh, this was uh, due to social norms and uh, some also institutional restrictions. So in the US, we had uh, famously these so-called marriage bans. These were laws uh, that prohibited women who were married uh, from working. Huh? So if, if, if you are employed in a, in a, in a, in a firm, and if uh, you get married, uh, they, they would hire you. Yeah? And uh, these firms would also not hire any women who were married. Yeah? So this, <laughs> this, uh, this, this were restrictions uh, to, to, to duration the, uh, the jobs and uh, to give them uh, to men. And as long as there was a, a large enough uh, supply of young unmarried women, uh, this, uh, this system also seemed to work. Yeah? So in this, uh, in this period, uh, Claudia Gordon uh, characterizes the women as they had a job first and they were young, and later on uh, they had a family and uh, no job anymore. Okay, so what, uh, what happens uh, when we go on in history? So during uh, the 1930s and later, these marriage bans were gradually uh, abolished. Yeah, so they were abolished because uh, the demand for work class uh, was rising and rising. There was the war when uh, men were in service and uh, women had to uh, replace them even in very male dominated occupations. So these, uh, these marriage bans, they were not anymore working. So they were, uh, they were abolished. Then there were lots of technological innovations in the household. So they invented washing machines and lots of things. So women uh, uh, had to uh, put free their time to do other things uh, than working in the household. And so in this period, so this was the period when these married women uh, started returning to uh, the labor force. Yeah? So before only the young unmarried women had been working, then they dropped out and stayed at home uh, for the rest of their lives. And now we see these older women who have children who are already grown up are uh, returning uh, to the labor market. Yeah? So they, they, uh, they go uh, into these office jobs. Uh, they are relatively low educated because uh, they uh, they never got an education because they never expected uh, to, uh, to to work later in their lives, and also they work in relatively low paid jobs. Yeah, so this uh, put pushed many women into the labor force, but these women were relatively uh, low paid. And then uh, in parallel uh, to explain this uh, this uh, earnings gaps, uh, another phenomenon that was that was occurring is uh, that the the way uh, of paying uh, for work was changing a lot as well. Yeah? So in the early time, in the agricultural time, or also in these uh, factory times, there were piece rate payments. Yeah? So if you produce uh, this uh, amount of things, you uh, you get the piece rate. And uh, so if you produce a bag of uh, potatoes, everybody is paid the same, whether they are a woman or a man. Then later on in this, uh, in this office jobs, uh, this, uh, this uh, personal uh, um, um, systems uh, were introduced and uh, work was not paid by the, uh, by the piece anymore, but uh, they introduced salary schemes. And these salary schemes, uh, they had the option to uh, discriminate between different uh, types of workers. Yeah? So these uh, salary uh, schemes in a way they introduced what we now call wage discrimination, that for the same type of work, women are de paid differently uh, than men. Yeah? So they had different contracts, uh, which uh, gave them a female wage instead of a male wage. Uh, they were banned from promotion, opportunities, uh, and things like this. Yeah? So this, this modern salary schemes or modern personnel uh, economics, the kind of um, uh, um, in, in 
introduced this uh, wage discrimination for women. So this is why we don't see much of a narrowing of the wage gap uh, in this period as well. So in this period, uh, Claudia Godin uh, characterizing uh, women as having a family and then a job. Yeah? So they come back to the labor market after having had a family. And then, uh, so we, we get to the late period, uh, which is the uh, so-called quiet uh, revolution. It's the period from 1970 onward, when we see this rapid, rapid increase in female labor force participation. And uh, so there were lots of things uh, that led uh, to this rapid uh, development. On the one hand, uh, uh, the, uh, the educational choices uh, again changed, so uh, women uh, had the opportunity to uh, attend college. And uh, so very soon, we, uh, we also see that uh, graduation rates from college for women uh, surpassed men. And then uh, another point is these uh, uh, expectations. Yeah? So in the, in the earlier period, women were not uh, expecting uh, to return to the labor market uh, once uh, their children had grown older. So they never uh, bothered to get an education uh, because they didn't think uh, they would ever need it later in their lives. Yeah? And if they have made their expectations, they were looking to their parents, uh, their mothers, uh, grandmothers' generation, and they saw mothers and uh, grandmothers at age 50, they are at home. Uh, so they, 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 they kind of formed the expectation by looking at the uh, older generations and uh, did not uh, um, uh, get the opportunities uh, that would open up for them. So it took a long time until uh, women invested really in the education and also. Uh, revised uh, their expectation of what opportunities they might have in the labor market. Yeah. So this was one point. And then another point is uh, this uh, techno technological innovations. Uh, so the contraceptive uh, pill was introduced in the, for, uh, approved in the United States in 1960. First, it was only available for married women. And then gradually, it also became available for unmarried women. And uh, so uh, Claudia Goldin, she did a very, very nice uh, design. So different states uh, allowed uh, the access to pill for younger women at different uh, uh, points in time. Uh, so she could compare uh, when the uh, pill was accessible uh, with the labor market outcomes, like uh, education decisions or uh, labor market for participation of, uh, of women. And she found uh, that, that the, uh, the pill had a big impact on uh, fertility, on education decisions, and uh, on female labor force participation. So now uh, women could time their fertility. It made sense for them uh, to invest in a long uh, college program. So they also got uh, higher degrees, not only a, a bachelor degree, uh, but they also got a medical degree or a law degree and things like this. And then uh, so they, uh, they could better um, uh, organize uh, their, uh, their careers. So now uh, in this uh, latest period, we have women who have uh, who can uh, in theory have both a career and a career. But this was only really in this latest period after all these uh, changes had happened. Okay, so here is this picture of the uh, college graduation rates uh, for men and women over time. So we can see uh, these uh, colleges um, um, were expanding massively after the 1920s uh, and 30s. Uh, but first it was men who took advantage of the colleges and women started uh, much, much later. Yeah? So this is this, uh, this, is this uh, expectations. Yeah? So they didn't think first that this college degree would uh, give to them any hope. And then uh, they were catching up uh, with men uh, until the 1960s. And since, since then, we can see that the college graduation rates of women is, is really higher than men. And this is not only so for the US, uh, this is also for European countries. It happened maybe later, uh, but, uh, but by now, uh, we see more graduates who are women. So this is the increase in uh, in these higher degrees, so medical law uh, and the business degrees. So this happened, of course, later in the nineteen seventies, and uh, so you can uh, you, you can show that this is very much related uh, to this uh, co contraceptive uh, technologies. Okay, okay. So why is there still a gap? Yeah. <laughs> so if we look at the most most recent uh, years. We can ask ourselves why uh, is the earnings gap between men and women not closing? Yeah? So why is there still a gap? And uh, so the pro most prominent uh, uh, explanations that that is out today is that this is due to children. Yeah? So that uh, women take breaks uh, after having children, and this uh, um, slows down uh, their careers. 
The first uh, two strategies was again Claudia Gordon with uh, two courses. Uh, so they looked at graduates from an MBA program, from a very prestigious MBA program in the United States, and they compared men and women uh, after graduation. Uh, so at, at graduation, there was hardly any earnings gaps between uh, men and women. Uh, so they had the same education, they had access to the same type of jobs, and they were also the same uh, amount of money. But then uh, if you followed them for 10 to 15 years, suddenly there were enormous gaps. Yeah? So uh, this, uh, these gaps opened up over time and they can show that this is all related or mostly related to having children. Yeah? So women who had a child, uh, they left these uh, high profile jobs, uh, went to either part-time or went, went to work in a part, uh, job with uh, less promotion opportunities. And uh, so these children are related uh, to, the, uh, to the earnings gaps. Here is this, uh, is this picture again by the Swedish Academy of Sciences. Uh, so here we have the, uh, the time, yeah? and we have this couple who's uh, come out of, uh, the, uh, of this uh, uh, MBA program. They start in the same uh, type of jobs, and uh, so they continue in the same type of jobs until uh, the woman gets pregnant. And then, uh, so they pass the voyage. Yeah? The men, the men uh, stay in the high earnings uh, jobs, like the women, uh, they lose in earnings because they take care of the children and then switch to uh, lower paid uh, part-time jobs or, uh, or other work opportunities. And uh, so, be, so if we look at uh, 10, 15 years out after that child is born, uh, they still this, uh, this is kept, yeah? so it's not getting back together, but it is, uh, uh, it is still there. So this is a, uh, it's bringing me to a, uh, no, there's not this other thing. Yeah, so the explanation for why this is happening is the following. Yeah? So we have now these couples who are both are very uh, well educated and they both have opportunities to make an, a career. And we can think of the labor market at all as offering two types of jobs. Yeah, so one uh, job is a, is a stable job with a stable income, which is uh, which you can uh, combine with family. So the work hour requirements are relatively flexible. And the other type of job is a job with very inflexible uh, work hour requirements. Yeah, so you have to be available for customers at all times, even during the holidays and even uh, during night time. These jobs pay enormously higher wages and these wages are increasing. Yeah? So the more effort you put into this job, uh, the, more, um, the more you earn. And if you are in a couple, one partner can work in this, uh, in this uh, uh, um, unflexible job, but the other partner, they uh, can. Yeah? So the other partner has to take, take care of the child. So these are the, what uh, Claudia Gordon calls greedy jobs. Yeah? So these flexible jobs are, are called greedy jobs, and they have, uh, they put this uh, division uh, in, uh, uh, in within the family. Yeah? So that one partner works in the greedy job, and the other partner takes care of the child. What is still remarkable is if, um, even if they, uh, if they specialize within the family, is that they always specialize um, the man taking the greedy job and the woman uh, taking this uh, uh, this uh, job with flexible hours. Yeah? So this is this must be something to do with uh, with gender norms, because otherwise uh, we could see a uh, combination and it wouldn't be uh, showing up in gender. So the the, the the question is really how can we increase uh, the workplace flexibility? Uh, how can we make our jobs uh, less greedy? So, yeah, so this is uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, research of Claudia Goldings with his uh, MBA students uh, spurred a lot of uh, um, uh, re uh, other research. Uh, so there is now what is called a child panel, the ATLAS, which looks at these um, learning gaps uh, after they open up after children are uh, born across lots of countries. Uh, so we, here we have Austria and Denmark and Ivory and the United States. We, we, we see from these graphs that these uh, gaps are different. Yeah? So in different countries, they are uh, not the same size. So, so for instance, Denmark is very, uh, there's a gap, but it is much, much smaller than, for instance, the gap in Austria <laughs> or Hungary. Uh, so this, uh, these gaps have to do with lots of other factors that are going on in these countries. Uh, but uh, the remarkable thing is that these gaps uh, are always there in any of these countries. So as soon as a child is born, uh, the women are going to drop her and to the, uh, to the men. So this, this is an example of uh, the impact of Claudia Bordin's uh, research on uh, labor economics. Uh, but of course, she had uh, lots of, a lot more uh, impact. Yeah? So at, at the time when she started in the 1980s, this, uh, uh, this gender research, 
hardly anybody was doing this. Yeah, and by now, uh, gender economics is a large, large field in economics. That's an important field, and uh, we have lots of people uh, actively researching here, which is uh, which is great. And uh, so here is a graph which shows. This is uh, put together by Claudia Olivetti, uh, Jessica Pan, and Barbara Bet-Mongolo uh, for a uh, new handbook of labor economics article. And they combine uh, the, uh, also they compare over time the articles in uh, top journals uh, which are dealing with gender uh, issues. Um, and you can see that these, these are these uh, red bars, they either uh, have female, women, or gender or a wife, maternity, and mother in the titles. Uh, so that this is really uh, increasing, taking off, especially after the 1980s. And it compares it uh, to, uh, to articles that have uh, race uh, in, the, in the topic, which is also a, 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 um, a topic where we study discrimination. So the articles studying race have been relatively uh, constant over time, but these gender issues have, have really, really taken off. Yeah? And this is not in the least uh, influenced by Claudia Gordon's uh, research, and then also uh, interest she uh, was generating this kind of issues. Okay, yeah. So I would like to close uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, this is from an interview uh, Claudia Gordon was uh, giving, and she was asked, uh, what are the most important uh, lessons from research on women in the labor force that she has le learned over her uh, over her life and her career? And she says, uh, so the, one of them is that the single most important change in the labor force for almost all countries was this increase in women's labor force participation. So this increase we see in the labor force participation of women over time. And then she says all labor economists at some point started women because women are the group, uh, group that provides experience. Uh, this, is, uh, this is what I said before. The women were always interesting, but uh, just nobody was interested in why are they different from men. And then the last thing is, uh, so uh, she says that these changes in the labor force, so for instance, due to an uh, expansion of education, they often lead to strong uh, clashes with uh, traditions and social norms. Yeah? So in the US, uh, this was not so uh, dramatic because everything happened very, very slowly. Yeah? So this was a long drawn out uh, process. But in other countries, if you think of developing countries, South Korea and uh, other countries, these things may, may happen very rapidly. Yeah? So this, and then there are these strong, strong pressures uh, with uh, traditions. So these women are highly educated and they would like to have good jobs. Uh, but uh, so their family tell them, no, no, uh, so you have to find a husband and you have to raise children and stay at home. So, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for listening. <laughs>